Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Welcome back to Fighting on Film, the war film podcast. And this week, we're embarking on Anzac Month. Now, this is something that we've talked about for a while uh, between us. We've had lots of suggestions for Australian films, almost the entirety that the podcast has been running. Yeah. People have been asking us, when are you going to do this Australian film, that Australian film? And we've always said, well, we'd really like to do an Anzac Month. Well, here it is. And we are kicking off with 1979's The Odd Angry Shot. What a great film to kick off Anzac Month with. You know, in the in the world of the it's non-film, different. it's different, isn't it? It's like when Danger Close came out, everyone was like, wow, an Australian Vietnam film. Um, and just to give a quick rundown of the plot before we do our, our cast and our production, uh, it's based on a 1975 book by William Nagel of the same name. And the film, it, it, instead of being a men on a mission movie like we usually have, I'm saying it's like men on a tour film. Yeah. And it follows um, 3rd Squadron Special Air Service Regiment in Vietnam in, we think, their second tour, which was 1969, uh, February, and then to February 70. But we'll, we'll, we'll tell you why later. Yeah, I was going to say you did a little bit of uh, clever detective work on that, didn't you? Yeah, that'll come apparent later. So Matt, production. Well, it's it's an interesting film. Uh, it had a budget of about 600000 Australian dollars. Um, apparently it overran uh, doing the uh, principal production by a, a couple of days and that that actually pushed the budget to about uh, 617000 uh, mm. according to the director uh, it was directed by Tom Jeffrey uh, who wrote and directed it uh, he worked on a number of other films lots of TV he'd actually been uh, ABC's um, director of drama in the 60s uh, produced lots wrote lots that sort of thing mm-hmm. and uh he adapted this from a uh, 1975 novella uh, by William Nagel. And you might remember William Nagel as he also wrote uh, The Siege of Five Ace Gloria with uh, Tony Johnston. I knew it rang a bell. He wrote this in 75. And then in 1986, he wrote a screenplay for a film called Death of a Soldier, which is all about a, uh, it's a, it's based on a true story. It's all about a US soldier who became a serial killer in Australia during the Second World War. That was a film star in um, James Cooper. Oh, I'll have to do that. That sounds great. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's a whole section in, a, in um, Fire and Fortitude about that, if I remember right, right. the book. Yeah, about the US Army in... Uh, in Australia, yeah. Fascinating. So as I said, it was based on uh, Nagel's 1975 novella. It's more or less the film. They take a mm. lot of the humour from that book and the plot, etc., and the characters. And... That book actually won a National Book Council Award um, for Australian literature oh, great. in 1975. And that's, that's I guess, how it came to the attention of uh, Tom Jeffrey and uh, Sue Millican, uh, the producer um, on, on, the, on the film. And they picked it up thinking that, that Nagel was actually a veteran of the uh, Australian SAS. But it later turned out that that wasn't the case. He'd been a regular soldier in the, um, the Australian Army. And then he'd uh, join the, the Australian Catering Corps and become a cook. And it becomes a little bit confused. Some sources say um, that he was in the Special Forces. One even says he was in the US Special Forces, which I don't think is, is right. And mm. then it, it, it basically looks like he was an army cook. And I would imagine quite possibly he was an army cook for perhaps... Um, the Australian SAS squadrons were, that were over there in Vietnam. Yeah, and, I read that as well, yeah. And I, I think that's probably the most most likely. Um, and it fits really well because you have that great uh, interaction between Harry and Cookie, the cook. Um, and yeah. They're always like sparring with one another and it's very funny. Some great scenes. That would make sense the most. One of the things that Sue Millican said was they didn't really mind too much because he had an ear for the vernacular of the Australians in, in Vietnam. And I think he does mm. capture that quite well. The dialogue is fabulous in it. Throughout the film, there's a bit where Harry complains about the rain 
You said you watch by the fucking rain. That's it. Love it. It's so good. <laughs> so many times. So it gets becomes such a, a I guess a meme that yeah. they all, whenever it rains, they all look at him waiting for him to say it. And then it, fun, they all, yeah. all say it in chorus. And, he even's and, yeah. got his Snoopy thing, hasn't he, that he puts up on his tent yeah, and pole. takes it home with him at the end as well. My life's tough enough, don't rain on me or something. It's just a great yeah. visual gag. It's quality. Uh, set design was by Bill Malcolm, who later worked on Gallipoli in 81. And he also worked on The Quiet American, another Vietnam film. Ah, um, yes. In 2002 with Michael Caine. Graham Green book. God, I do like that book. I actually mm. like the film. Production design was by uh, Bernard Hydes, and he would later work on Attack Force Z in 1981. Casualties of War in 89 and The Light Horseman in 1987. Oh, that's some repertoire. That's yeah. that's pedigree, that isn't it? Um, it was filmed over six weeks uh, in locations uh, that were provided by the Australian Army, uh, mm-hmm. principally the Jungle Warfare Training Centre at Conungra. I think that's pronounced as... Yep. Yeah, I think that's right, isn't it? Canada. I'm sure any Australian listeners will correct us. So Please apologies do. in advance. Uh, in Queensland. And um, they had help from uh, the Australian Army and the uh, the Australian uh, Air Force as well. And some of the street scenes uh, when they, they go and leave were filmed at the uh, Sydney showgrounds. They were built purposely because there was nowhere oh. that looked um, okay. enough like they are great. That's a great little set. To be it fair. is, and it's really underused yeah. as well. It's just an yeah, establishing shot, and like, there's a little bit where your kid runs through it. Yeah, it, it's like a very good. Ten set. minutes of screen time or something. Yeah, yeah. As I mentioned, the uh, the Hueys were actually provided by um, the Australian Air Force from Nine Squadron, and uh, Nine Squadron had been in Vietnam, and those exact Hueys had been used in Vietnam. Oh wow! So that's an, a really a nice little inclusion. Mm. And and finally, uh, the film was actually uh, re- restored in. 2016 to mark the 50th anniversary of Long Tan, the Battle of Long Tan. Okay. Restored by the National Film and Sound Archive. Yeah, they, they do some great stuff, actually. Um, I've been working on some uh, Australian projects um, for my channel, and uh, the NFSA have some great... Um... Are in military history. Do check it out. <laughs> yeah, please do. Uh, links links on my Twitter and stuff. They have some great stuff. And that restoration is crisp, isn't it? It's so nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. It looks like it was made yesterday. Yeah, it does. Like That's the great thing with film. You can keep you can keep working at it, you can keep improving it. And and it just that's the thing we're gonna lose with digital films going forward. You know, the the way it was shot and you know, now is gonna be the way it's preserved forever. But with film, you can keep making it look nice. Yeah, it's kind of like that with music, isn't it? Like the, the, yeah, you can remaster tapes, but when as soon as they started recording like digitally, mm. you lost that ability to upscale. Yeah, you're gonna lose something, aren't you? But but that, that's a that's a, a chat for another day. Cast this week, so I mean, if you're an Australian listener, the, these chaps are going to be well-known faces. Um, but to us, Poms in the UK, we might not know them as well. But by gosh, the cast do a really good job. They do. Yeah, really good. So we have Graham Kennedy as Harry. He's your old sweat. Um, and he's played by Graham Kennedy. And Graham Kennedy was, they call him the king, the king of Australian TV. He's this broadcaster, entertainer, radio host. You know, really, really famous guy out there. And this was a big film for him. I was when I was researching for reviews, they're saying this is the first starring role in a movie that he had. I think he's appeared in some other films before that, but not quite as the, the lead. Um, and he also was in uh, The Killing Fields in 1987 as Dougal. But he's great in it. I mean, it's just the comic relief that he provides. He is, yeah. Fantastic. You know, uh, his favourite scene, my favourite scene of the movie is, is with him in it. I'll, I'll talk about it later. Um, we've got John Jarrett as Bill. He's a, he's a proper cult Australian new wave actor. He was in Django Unchained, um, had a cameo in that. He, and he's Who's he in that? He is one of the, you know when Tarantino turns up and he's doing that awful Australian accent? Oh, no way. Yeah, he's one of the... One of the other guys. Miners in that. Yeah, he's in that section, yeah. That's, um, that's wow, Jack, okay. John Jarrett. I'm going to I'm gonna have to make sure I look out for that next time. Yeah. Um, and then he was in Wolf Creek as well. Uh, we've got Brian Brown as Rogers. And he was uh, Hancock in Break and Morant uh, the year after this one. Yes. So yeah, that's another yeah. great connection to a to an Australian war movie there. And in TV, he played Luke O'Neill in The Thornbirds, and he received a lot of awards for his role in that. Uh, John Hargreaves plays Bung. He was in the 1988 film Emerald City with Nicole Kidman. Uh, we've got Ian Gilmore as Scott. Um, these are all Australian actors. Richard Muir as the medic. Uh, Graham Blundell as Dawson. 
Uh, the cook was played by Graham Rouse. And to be fair, I mean, there aren't many other big roles in this. There, there are people that come and go. Some of the actors just don't have any real IMDb pages. I couldn't find any much information on some of the people because there's a character who is a, a British, northern British sounding CSM. Oh, the RSM. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he has two lines. I was trying to find who that guy was and it just, I just couldn't find him. Called, I think he's called Mike Harris, but I couldn't find anything about the chap. So it was a little bit difficult at times, but the cast for what they do, for who they do have, do a really good job. Big stars in Australia, they obviously are, but doesn't need to have big names attached to it because I think the dialogue and what they're doing is a lot more than the, perhaps the characters. That makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree that I think, I think they, they're very competent. That It's a mm. competent cast and especially, especially the character Harry is so pivotal to the whole film that I think the film hangs around him really. And it's yeah. his interactions with other characters, which make it so interesting. Because mm. um, I had the feeling that you know, you've got Bill who is leaving um, for the, for, I assume his first tour, but I assume they're yeah. already in because these guys are, all know each other before they go. It's when it's established. Well, yeah, they're all SAS too. So they're all, yeah. they're all highly trained soldiers. So yeah, exactly. They... And I liked how it went against convention. First time I saw this many years ago, I thought, okay, we're going to get him being, oh, you know, this is my first tour and I've not been a soldier before. Oh, isn't war hell? But you don't actually get that. You get a five minute vignette of him being it's his birthday and he's leaving or something. And then you're on yeah. a plane to Vietnam and then it's all Nam until the end. There's no fat on this film. It's all. No, th those scenes are just there to bookend, aren't they really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it makes sense because they want to show a young man going off to war. Mm. Um, and they work really well. They, they establish a, a, a vibe. The, the inclusion of the leaving on a jet plane record because leaving on a jet plane was a, a record that was linked heavily in Australia with yes. men going to war in Vietnam. That gets put in there. Um, it establishes a little bit of his backstory. I think it really works because when they come home, it's it's him and him and Harry in the bar, and it bookends the the bulk of the movie quite well. I think. Yes, I do feel that way. It's a good it's a good starting into the film. Um, I really yeah. do enjoy. Yeah, I like this one all the way through, and I, at no point was I getting bored at all. Um, unlike last week's the eight hundred, there was no dip for me. Um, I thought everything was quite well. And as I, as I'll go forward, I, I in my final thoughts, I think I'll explain why more that I think it works um, to keep you interested. But this week I have a retro review, and this comes from uh, Film News, which was a Australian uh, paper, like a newspaper about films. Uh, and the review that I found for the odd angry shot was written on the 1st of May 1979, um, which was around the time of the release. And they're talking about three Vietnam films in this article. The first one is Apocalypse Now. The second one is The Deer Hunter that had just came out in Australia in the February of 79. So it's hot on the heels, really. Um, and obviously the odd angry shot being the first Australian made a film about the war. There was lots to say. So this uh, review comes in off of uh, the uh, writer uh, Barbara Elson. Uh, talking uh, about uh, Deer Hunter maybe being a little bit too heavy-handed with its message and saying that the odd angry shot isn't. So we'll join her review. And she says, you can't by contrast accuse Tom Jeffries, the odd angry shot of its pushiness in trying to make its point. Apart from one or two references to public indifference and Graham Kennedy's astounding speech on his reasons for joining the army, he found his wife in bed with another man. The film is morally derelict and intentionally so. Jeffrey's film traces the experiences of a group of professional soldiers on one year's tour of duty in Vietnam. Most of the battles are drunken brawls in camp, encounters with the enemy a few, and the violence is mostly passive, not active. Between the drinking and the ribald sexist humour, the odd angry shot emerges as a catalogue of losses. One soldier loses his girlfriend, another his wife, and yet another his feet. I don't think she watched the film, did she? Because for for one, he he didn't come home to his wife in bed with another man, and no one lost his wife. It was his uh, sister and mother sister got killed in a car crash. Yeah. So she's obviously written that review, forgetting some of the details. Made some interesting points though. Other than that, other than those two little things, but yes, I agree. No, that that's interesting. Um, yeah, Deer Hunter can be a little bit bleak, can't it? Um, mm. and there's none of that with this. This is this is a film which is very different in tone to anything that comes out of America, I think, largely. Yes, it and is. And very different in, in approach to a lot of war films in that it's... When I was doing reading around this, I saw time and, 
time and again in articles about it in retrospective that it's very much about mateship um, and the concept of, of mates um, being in war and that's very true and that's that rings true with a lot of Australian uh, war movies Breaker Morant Gallipoli goes all the way back to the beginning of Australian war cinema I think and it it works well and I think I think the review is probably fair in in that, and it does mention yeah. the fact that there's some sexist language in there. There's some sexist, there's some racist, and there's some um, well jarring, you know, language in there. But it's reflective of what Nagel wrote and what Nagel probably heard yeah. in Vietnam. Well, as that, it's that eight old age. It's, it's of its era. It's it's a cultural artifact in and of itself, isn't it? And obviously, the war had only ended like four years before this movie was four made. Four years, so. yeah. And this is the this is the first film that that looks at the war directly. I think there was one previously in, in the late sixties about a uh, soldier that deserts. I forget the title. Your um, Australian film is that? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, mm. But this is definitely the first, and it comes amid that big glut of of war movies about us uh, about vietnam doesn't it yeah, go tell the spartans in 78 the 79 you get apocalypse now the big hitters deer hunter 78 yeah. i think you know as we say this movie is quite important because there aren't many films about apart from danger close um there aren't and there's long Tam, which is a drama a, a docudrama that came out in 2005 or six i think um but there's not many so this is an important movie in historical terms um because sometimes i think the, the Australian involvement in Vietnam can be sort of pushed to to the wayside un, un, unfairly. I think um, perhaps um, American studios don't know how to handle um, their story, perhaps. Uh, perhaps not. But yeah, I know what you mean there. As anyone who studied Vietnam, you, there's a lot going on. Sometimes you can miss beats if, if you're looking at the broader picture, because when you watch those Vietnam War documentaries, it's always Tet. You know, it's always Hue or it's Khaesan. It's never... Long Tan, it's never the Australian task force. Very rarely they might get a mention, but they're never, there's never an episode on them. Um, I just thought that was interesting to mention. But we have our one word reviews again. A lot of you had a lot of good one word reviews this week because I think what we found through our, our talking about our Odd Angry Shot that is one of those really beloved war movies. It's one we got asked whether we were going to do a, a lot. lot. So a it made lot. complete sense to begin Anzac Month <laughs> it did. with the Odd Angry Shot. So we've got uh, Craig Seaton says Bonza. We've <laughs> Dominic Suave says realistic. We've got Lost in Translation with terrific. Brian Williams says Australian. Uh, Rubber again says Bonza. Uh, the last one, uh, which <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. At Z Pivo says Wank, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> it threw me a little bit. So I was like, well, hang on. Do you think the move? Uh, it's not because the movie's wank. It's because of the Padre scene, isn't it? it has to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is a great scene. Which is a great little scene. They make in this little uh, self-pleasure box, shall we say? Yes. I mean, we've already used the word wank, but yeah, it's a wanking machine. Basically, they make him. It is, yeah. Um, and they have this great handcrafted. bit where... Handcrafted, yeah. Um, and they they present him this box they've made, and they, the Padre goes on about, oh, thanks, lads. This is, this is such a nice gift to get. You know, often I, I I feel like an outsider, but you really made me feel like part of the part of the squad. You know, um, we'll give it the nicey nicey, and then he turns around to me and says, "This is the best wanking machine I've ever had," and he just walks away. <laughs> it's so so yeah, good. It's one of my favorite scenes. So, without further ado, I think we should get into the alley tally. It's time for alley tally on fighting on film. So, as I said earlier, in, when we were talking about production, it, it was made with the assistance of the Australian Army um, at their Jungle uh, Warfare Training Centre. It looks like they were provided um, rifles and, and equipment. They've customised them a little bit. I know it doesn't go far enough for you, Rob, because we've already talked about this. I know that you were hoping for cut-down SLRs, 40-round yeah, like, Bren mags. Um, uh, you know, uh, pistol grips reused as, as yeah, it's four grips. grips and, yeah. I said off air that, you know, you could go two ways. You could go really customised or you could just play it safe. And they play it safe, but it still works. It doesn't, it doesn't not, it's not wrong. You know, it's not, nothing's wrong about it. Absolutely. I mean, there's lots of things they could have included as well, like yeah. suppressed stairlings, um, captured Viet Cong weapons, that sort F1s, of thing. F1s, if you don't. Yeah, yeah, F1s even. Like no one has an F1, which is a shame. F1s get a bad rap anyway. No one had an F1 in Oz. There's like two pictures I've ever found of them. I know. No one, no one, no one wanted to be seen with them, apparently. Like, 
No Owen guns. Um, no, no like, Owen guns. I think what it is there is the Australian army wasn't prepared to, to go full realism and start cutting down perfectly good SLRs. Well, they're still in service, aren't they? It's like you, you're, you'd be, you know, bastardising kit they might need. <laughs> so exactly. it's like maybe um, not, yeah. But they are all painted. Um, mm-hmm. They all have, I, I like that they included the field dressings taped to the stocks. Really nice. Um, yep. Some of the M16s have got M203 grenade launchers. The SLRs are painted up as well. And it's just its just a representative selection of weapons. And yes. You have the, the L1A1 SLRs, the M16A1s. Um, you have uh, an M60 makes an appearance at the end of the film. It does. And there's quite a bit of a blat with that. And there's even a white phosphorus grenade. A white phosphorus um, grenade gets used in the the end of the film as well. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. I'm sure. Yeah, um, they throw they throw that right at the end, don't they? They do. And I I liked I like the um, the cut off jungle hats. Really nice. A couple of lads had, had cut off the yeah, the brims of their jungle hats. They're like the the new version of the bush hat, I think. At that point, yeah. they're like jungle field hats. Um, yeah. And you see a lot of modifications of lads like to cut them up. To, to be more comfortable and there's a whole video on that on the awm about like field fashion and it's like the whole video oh, wow. about the hat yeah that's um, amazing it's that's, really interesting the, look at that the uh the the script is um transcribed but there's no audio on the on the actual video but you can sort of read and, and check and there's lads who've written you can things. read it in your best australian overdub voice <laughs> yeah you know yeah, cool. I'm sure. I'm sure the Australian listeners would love a, an Englishman doing a ra- really yeah. Do it, Rob. There's a video for the channel. Get it done. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you've got people that ri- that written Melbourne on it, or like see you see you at home in Melbourne, things like that. Like so, yeah. With the Americans right on their M1 uh, helmet covers, yeah, helmet covers. You've got the Aussies right on their little field hats, which I quite really like. The little I really like that to see it, but but that that's an aside. Uh, all the thing that stood out to me was uh, an RPD getting a name mm. check. Yeah, um, yeah, the 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 lieutenant of the of the um, the platoon or the, the company shouts that there's an RPD over there, and there is a guy with an RPD, um, a, a, a VC. Um, you this weapons uh, weapons recognition guide. He had, yeah, well done, that man he knows his stuff. Um, yeah, that was cool. That that's in the very final scene, which is, I, incidentally, my favourite scene. So we'll talk about that more later on, but. You don't see them come up in films very often, and it was it was nice to see. Um, obviously, it must have been from the Jungle Training School's um, yes. weapon recognition collection, I would imagine. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that fully auto M2 carbine either. When, uh, when again, the yeah, I, mean, I guess that, that was probably from the weapons familiarization yeah. collection of the, the training center had. As we know, I, I like my uniforms and equipment, um, so I was doing a little bit of research on the SA SR in Vietnam. And they're all wearing, uh, in the movie, they're all wearing their Erdl third pattern jackets, the, the camo- more sort of woodland camouflage that we all sort of know now to be, um, uh, you know, intrinsically linked with the military. But back in the 60s, it was new. It was a new thing. Um, and the SASR used it a lot in Vietnam. They said that it was perfect for all situations. Interestingly, MACV SOG uh, and the LARP teams, uh, they didn't think as much of the Erdl as the SASR did. Um, so they tended to use it when it, it was they were in really jungly sort of type terrain, whereas the, the SASR thought it was quite good for every situation. So they became synonymous with the use of it. Um, and then you see a mixture of the US uh, M56 uh, webbing and Australian webbing. And the Australians produced their own M56 version of the M56 webbing. Um, and But then you also see Rogers wearing the larger 44 pattern um, pouches from the Second World War, and they were used as well. Um, and the SAS also get their own pouches for S- SLR magazines, and they were called the SAS pouch. And they were two small box pouches for um, SLR use, but they're not in the movie, unfortunately. Um, you just get the, I think it's the fifty-six webbing uh, pouch in in the use of. Right. Um, but I thought there's just some really interesting little um, personalizations on the kit. Some men have got their knives high some men have got three or four water bottles behind or some men have got a water bottle on the left or a you know a, a, a three ammo pouches on the side you see a lot of um customization in the kit and i it was nice to you know see that not only from a historical point of view but from a movie point of view so every man who's got a different weapon is using a webbing rig that is representative of the weapon they're using so it was just a nice little touch and then going back to my point earlier in the pod where how i 
think the movie is set in a certain time zone. So I did a little bit of digging and third squadron um, uh, SAS uh, regiment did one tour in 66, 67. I know you were looking at Harry's medal ribbons, weren't you? I was. Yeah. Yes. So you said he was wearing a South Vietnam medal. Yeah, so um, Harry's seen with medals at the beginning and the end of the movie um, on his, um, uh, well, it's it says they're about to, to, to leave for Vietnam on the on plane. It, yeah. And on he's seen with uh, an Australian General Service medal, which could be uh, Malaya or uh, Brunei or uh, a couple of other places. Uh, and then he's also seen with the, uh, the Republic of uh, Vietnam campaign medal, which is 1960 onwards. And, right. uh, and then he also has the, uh, Australian military's Vietnam medal as well. So he's got three medal take. Uh, he's got three medal ribbons, and kind of indicates that he's been in theatre before, and he's right. also a veteran of possibly somewhere else as well. Sure, because he you know he could have been in Borneo or or Malaya because I think the SASR went there. He talks about in the film, doesn't he? But um, his motivations. He was an artist, and then his wife sort of lost interest in him. Mm. And there's no no hint of, of adultery. It's just that she, it's know, sort she of maybe assumed. It. I think it wants you to assume why. Yeah, I mean probably, but you know, anyway, it's not explicitly said. Um, and he just goes and joins the army, and then he's yeah. in, and he's I think he's a corporal, isn't he? Yeah, that's it. Um, he's one of the old sweats, anyway. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I thought that his, you know, he would have done that first tour in sixty six, sixty seven. Absolutely makes sense. The second tour they do was uh, february 69 to february 70 and the reason i'm putting my historian's hat or pinning my historian's badge on that fact is that we have as you said m203 m16s in use and um, with the you know with the underslung grenade launcher um yeah you know as used by uh sean bean in uh bravo 20 um <laughs> <laughs> if you remember that one um it's just because it's on the cover i always think of that when i think of that movie yeah I think that no goes, yeah, so very true. Like, yeah yeah um so yeah i'm thinking that that's the tour that they're on um just because of that um and it would make sense with the erdl as well because erdl pattern uniforms didn't come in until about 67 so that would make sense um and then you get to see uh australian jungle greens as well um but there's no australian what do they call it? They call it, it's, it's like their own version of a third pattern that they made. Um, right. You don't get to see it. And they've got like, it's got like slanted pockets and um, like a pocket on the shoulder. I mean, Ralph and Moore's done a video on it. It's, it's quite interesting. If you're interested in Australian kit, you know, there's plenty of stuff to go. I'm not going to try and bore everyone with it, but for me, I, <laughs> I really like it. It's just one of those things. Um, yeah. And the last thing I'll, I'll bore everyone with um, is in certain scenes in the, in the camp, they're listening to Australian Forces Radio Vietnam, which I thought was a oh. nice inclusion. And they mock it as well. Yeah, they, and they take the piss out of Sing the news, jingle. The news jingle, yeah, um, which is quite, I think it's quite a nice little inclusion because it is. It's like we, you know, we think of Good Morning Vietnam, the Americans had their own radio. So it's just showing the Aussies had their own. But yeah, so that was my little, my little kit roundup there for anyone who cares. Lovely stuff. Lots in this film. So much oh, stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of depth. Lovely stuff, as Alan Partridge would say. <laughs> idea for a show robbie mcguire talks about australian kit with chris eubank webbing down under <laughs> oh my god okay. with sam o'neill to direct <laughs> oh yeah that'd be great yeah sam o'neill doing the voiceover and then the australians made their own in 56 webbing and boy god it was glorious sam o'neill sounds nothing no, he like doesn't, that but, you know. sam o'neill sounds nothing like that it's just gonna make, make a meme now of him in jurassic park like taking his glasses off but it'll be him looking at some 56 webbing <laughs> Da, 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 da. I, I'm, I'd watch it. Yeah, I'd watch it. Sam Neill doing that. That'd be great. <laughs> Jurassic pouches. It's going to be interesting to see how much of this makes it into the it's show, not isn't much. it? Wow. Not okay. much. It's been a long Monday, guys. So, from webbing to favourite scenes this week. Hello there. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. Favourite scene for me, I think um, I have a couple. Already mentioned the scene with the Padre. I'll talk about that one first, and I'll talk about my main favourite scene. So there's a, there's a lovely little bit where um, one of the characters is seen doing a little bit of arts and crafts in the mess tent. 
got some feathers taped to a coat hanger inside a, a nice shoe box that he's painting blue. And uh, he says, this is for the Padre because he's made us all feel so um, at home yeah. um, and been so helpful. And he asked me why I hadn't been coming to church service. And I said, I've been working on a little project. And uh, the Padre arrives and they hand it over in like a, a little uh, speech. Harry gives a little speech about how much um, help the Padre has been. And the Padre's there full of emotion, obviously. Takes the gift. He plays he plays dumb on it and he he makes them all feel a little bit guilty. He's like, thanks for making me yeah. feel so welcome. I've been in this man's army for 15 years, but I still feel like a bit of an outsider. Um, so it's nice to know that you boys have taken me to heart and you've gone to the trouble of making me this gift. They're all looking quite sheepish and, and feeling quite guilty about you know, they've they've made this for the, for the nice padre, and he's he's taking it as a very serious, heartfelt gift. And then he just turns around and and goes, and this is the best. What's it? What's he call it? Like homemade wanking machine? machine I've ever received. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just the microcosm of the whole film's tone. It's it's very yeah. good. It was very um, funny. It's really good. It, you know, you assume he's received them from other lads before, and he's seen this shit before. Must have been the thing they bought him off with every time. It was really nice. So I, so I love that scene um, for the humour. And then my other favourite scene is the uh, the final scene on the bridge, mm. um, where there's a, a local uh, Vietnamese uh, offensive, and they have to go and sort of blunt it. It's a bit truncated, but I mean, a lot of the uh, the, the sequences in the film are truncated because of the the almost vignette formula that it goes with to show the tour. And uh, they all, they all troop off um, into the jungle and it's, it's all the lads. So it's not just the, the, the two, two patrol. It's, it's all the other elements of the company. They're all there with the, the, the lieutenant as well. Yeah. It's the only time you ever see any more than just the four of them or five of them. Yeah. 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 Um, and they, they're apparently they're told to take this bridge and they, there's an artillery barrage on the far side and then uh, Bung and, a, and Harry move over the bridge and Bung gets killed uh, by a burst of um, 30 carbine from an M2 carbine in full auto from a VC trench. And he, he, yeah. he falls He's over the side of the bridge. Into the river, isn't he? Yeah. 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 And they successfully take the bridge. There's uh, a lot of suppressive fire. Um, which is which is great. Um, Bill's on an M60. I think Bill's their like weapons specialist. They never say it, but it's like implied, no. I think it? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harry throws in a white phosphorus grenade, um, and they they manage to take out the the, the mm. tiny BC enemy force, which yeah, is on see, the other like, side one, of the bridge. One's been set fire to, don't you? As well, I wasn't yeah, expecting yeah. that. Um, yeah, and they they leave him to burn uh, because mm. Bong's been killed. And yeah, I think the it's the, the lieutenant that that yeah. finishes him off. Yeah. That, um, that line, I wonder, it's, it's just not it's just an obs- as an observation, but I wonder how many times the line let them burn has been used in war movies. Because it's in that's a good question. Private Ryan, it's in uh, A Bridge Too Far when they blow up the bunker Fury. with Flamethrower. Fury as well. Twice. Twice, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's almost up there with like Handy Hawk sort of territory, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a very heavily used line, no matter yeah. the, the period. Just an interesting um, little observation. Yeah. There's a full special episode coming in the future on <laughs> on use of that line. Um, well, you could do yeah, one, you could do one on cliched lines, couldn't you? Perhaps. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, that'd be a really good one to do. Um, mm. Anyway, sorry. And then they they get a radio message to say fall back, and yeah. the lieutenant is. You can the dialogue in that is actually very clever, and, and the, the way he delivers those lines, he's so annoyed, but he keeps it stifled so the mm. men don't see it. Company HQ, Battalion HQ says, um, well done on taking the bridge. And he says, that give them my regards, you know. Yeah. And yeah. they they fall back over the bridge and shows that, that entire sequence was just a waste of time. Bung's life didn't need to be lost. And it's no. it's a scene that summarizes the film's entire ethos of the futility of war, which Harry has a number of monologues about. Mm. Um and there's various little scenes that hint at this. And that scene just summarizes the film's vibe yeah. and what it's trying to get across with the futility of war. It's not an anti-Vietnam film. It's more of a film that is anti-war in general, because one of my favorite scenes is Harry's monologue where he talks about, well, it's 
it's always the poor man that lines up to be handed a rifle first and all the rich lads stay and wait for a commission or a safe job. It's a great and he, little thing that he goes off on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I, I think it's, is it Bung that asks him about, you know, what do they think, what do you think they'll think of all this at home? And he says they won't give a shit. Yeah, they'll, um, they'll care for like a week or so. And then they'll yeah, go back to an election them. issue and he hits yeah. the nail on the head and it's all, yeah. you, could, you could easily just go, that's hindsight. But if you were, if you were um, someone who had been in say um, Borneo or Malaya or um, elsewhere and, and hell, if, even if you'd been a, uh, on a previous tour in Vietnam, you would know the lay of the land and, and, and what public opinion on the war was. So it makes complete sense that that would be something that was possibly probably talked about. Um, but yeah, I just really liked that scene. I thought it was a well shot little sequence, and apparently, um, it was filmed not far outside of Canungra, where the um, the Australian Army's uh, jungle training village is. Uh, I think we had a comment through um, on Twitter from I think was it the Australian Defence um, Association Defence Association uh, sent us a tweet about that when we said we were covering this movie, um, which nice little piece of trivia to include, mm. and. Another thing I did see uh, written about that elsewhere is there's uh, the white road stripe is is down the middle of the road, which is yeah, something that probably that. wouldn't bit, have been there. In, I was in, like, um, they have that in Nam? Hmm. Yeah, no, but it's, it, it doesn't, it's nothing about this jars you too much. It doesn't pull you out completely, does it? That's the great thing about using the Jungle Warfare Centre. But, but getting back to that whole thing about it being an anti-war film, uh, it's interesting mm-hmm. because a lot of those movies coming out of Hollywood at the time were all very, oh, uh, why do we go there, man? Like, why are we fighting, man? It's all very, like, post-war guilt. It's anti-war, but it's not anti-why are we here. It's not like, well, they're not going about, oh, man, like the politicians don't understand Vietnam, you know. Well, yeah, is. yeah. I mean, Harry even says, well, we're here because we're soldiers. Yeah, exactly. Then that, I think that's more, it's quite a refreshing take on the on the war than we tend and to I, get. I think one thing that plays into that is the fact that they are professional soldiers. They're SAS. And there's a sequence where they're inserted into the jungle and they do a fast rope down from the mm-hmm. helicopters. And that's the that's point great. in the film where you go, oh, yeah, of course, they aren't conscripts. They aren't draftees. They aren't um, regular soldiers. These guys are Australia's elite. And it's joked about before in the film when they're about to get on the plane. Um, Harry, Harry, Harry jokes about how they've obviously been briefed that they're Australia's elite and they have yep. to set a fine example in country. But it's not until you see them fast rope, which obviously was done with the help of the army. Um, mm. Looks great. It does. It's a great little sequence. But it's then that you realise that these guys are the professionals. Sets them apart from uh, a film about draftees that have been forced to fight in Vietnam. And I think that's a different angle as well, where we're not conscripts. They're, they're jobbing soldiers as well. It's different how you approach mm. how you approach it. Um, and that is it. That, that's another reason to watch the movie is you get a different take um, as well within a film. Um, but my favourite scene, as you were talking about the, the dialogue, don't get me wrong, those the small action scenes we get are very well done. Yeah, um, they break it up nicely. Break up nicely. Yeah, and we'll talk about the vignette uh, sort of vignette, almost sketch type way of the movie's uh, approach yeah. uh, in the final technical thoughts. terms on this podcast. Vignette. <laughs> I've got an A-level in film studies. Does it show? <laughs> but my favourite scene is the about halfway through the movie, they get to go and leave, and they're in the rear camp where they're going to leave on R and R. So uh, they initially take the Mickey of the the, the the hut they're going to get their money from, or go and ask about money because um, it's got aircon, and they sort of do a dun 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 dun, dun, dun like news flash thing, and they're like, you know, shock horror today. Three, uh, what was it? I've written it down. Our oh, logistics base at Bung Tao died today as the air conditioner failed. Three other men are in critical condition because they heard the ice for the beer hadn't arrived. That's really funny because you always find that in films and you, you sometimes get that within history and, and reading war diaries and things that, you know, troops taking the piss out of the people in the rear. And that's a war movie trope as well, I think. It is. Rear, uh, um, rear echelon motherfuckers, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's ramps. Yeah, that's it. Um, but then they go into the, the hut um, and there's this really surly CSM. Oh, yeah, he's, he's the king of all ramps. Oh, gosh, yes. And he's writing a report or something. And Harry's like, where, where can we change our money? After getting his attention by making his typewriter, like, go back. What unit are you with? And he goes, oh, we're SAS, um, sir. And he goes, oh, you know, you must think you're the best of the best type. 
thing, or you must think you're the heroes or something. And he goes, oh, bloody tin heroes at him. And then Harry just loses it and goes, oh, get fucked. And the guy's like, what? Like, he's absolutely <laughs> enraged by this. And he's like, I said, get fucked, you big beer sodden pile of shit. I'll put you on a charge. And then Harry responds and goes, well, you best make it murder because I'm going to knock your fucking head clean off. That dialogue had me. I was laughing for a good five minutes. It just every time. It's just the way Harry, it's the way Kennedy delivers it. It's with such conviction. And then. Yeah, I agree. An officer comes in and he he talks him down and he's like, look, you know, you can get your money changed at the post office, but please don't cause any trouble, any more trouble. Um, but it's a nice little sequence because they're pissed off because they just had a couple of their mates die on patrol. So they just want to go and get their rocks off, but they just find in all this sort of red tape. It was a, a nice little sequence. Um, the dialogue in the movie makes the movie because um, it's just so Absolutely. sharp. Yeah, and um, that, that scene encapsulates that. Quite well. Yeah, and you and you feel like they're all buddies. You know, they 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 talk about like paying each other. I'll buy you a beer, but that just means I'll go and get you a beer from a tent. Or, you know, they go oh, if you want information about where your pack's gone missing, it costs you twelve beers. It's all very sort of chummy, matey. You, mm-hmm. you feel you feel it's re- like realistic dialogue. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. So, final thoughts, Matt. I really like this film. I think it's it's refreshing. I said it before, but it is. Um, it's just, it's a little bit different to other Vietnam War movies. Um, we've covered a few now on the podcast. None of the big hitters because we're saving them, but we will get there. It's got such a really light tone to it throughout, yeah. but it has these moments of, of, of you know, real seriousness. Mm. Um, one of the first of those comes with the mortar attack at the beginning of the film, and it's their first. Yeah. And that comes action. out of absolutely nowhere. Mm, they're and just playing got, cards. And, and you've it, got that land disemboweled. Uh, yeah, exactly. It really it's hits you home really Really quick. visceral. And mm. um, there's some really good um, practical effects there with the with the um, lab, a guy's had his um, stomach blown open. There's a guy yeah. with uh, head wounds. There's a guy with his thigh ripped open. Yeah. Um, and it's it's just, it's not what you expect. And the film does a very good job of, of that flip to this yes. Yes. really well like from that. from kitchen sink every day playing cards chatting having a beer to mortar attack catastrophic wounds deaths their first their first deaths within the company because um, i think that also shows that some of them are used to being in country so they're not on edge all the time like sometimes yeah. you get in NAM films like oh man where's the enemy going to come from like with their american group like conscripts because these guys have been there, seen there, done it, some of them, they're quite relaxed in the environment. And then the cut to action, sorry, is quite is still quite jarring for them. And I, yeah, I like that yeah. nuance there. And the, there's still humour in there. So when the medic is is tending the guy with the thigh wound, he says, the the, the wounded guy asks if he's going to lose his leg. And he says, not unless they're pissed, mate. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. So there's still levity within those moments of, of, of seriousness, mm. which, which I really like. And there's a bit where he asks for a cigarette, and I thought he meant for the chap on the floor, but he <laughs> takes it and starts smoking it, <laughs> which I thought was a really nice little clue. Whether it was a joke or not, I don't know, but it made me laugh. Um, there's other bits that stop the movie dead a little bit, where they go off into on, on leave and they're, they're in town with the two American GIs, um, and they... They grab a young lad that's that's um, conned. See that bit's good. It is up until the prostitute scene. Yeah, the bit with Bill where the, where he stood at the end of the bed, he's got like full on murderous stare going on, and it's yeah, it's, he looks really odd. Yeah, I don't know whether that was because something was cut from there. Um, Perhaps I don't know, but it doesn't work, and that kind of stops it dead. And there's a couple of other bits that are questionable. There's there's some jokes about the Holocaust um, where they're having a shower which are quite sensitive for audiences now, I would imagine, probably then as well. Um, I think the, the medic is Jewish. Well, I'd put it down to just squaddy humour, perhaps. It is. That's totally what it is. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a little bit jarring where he, there's, there's a... It comes a out of nowhere sort of thing. It yeah. does, yeah. So, yeah, there's some bits of, of humour, which I suppose shocking, but soldier humour can be quite shocking at times. Different attitudes at different times. It's all within the historical context. Um, and then we've got a couple of scenes where that don't work as well for me is there's a weird moment where they're doing um, uh, a dust off for next film. Um, and Huey's make a couple of minigun runs, but it doesn't show you what they're shooting at. 
there's no VC chasing them when they get to the, the landing zone to, to, um, to exfiltrate. And the score is just weird. And it doesn't mm. quite work as I well. I think I know the bit. Is that where they're taking Rogers away? Because he's had his chest yes. blown out. Right. I think so. Yeah. I, I mean, I, this is just me. I assume they were just doing that to scare anyone away. I assume so. But yeah. it, it just didn't really work. It hadn't been cut and edited as well as it could have been, I think. Look at that bit again. Yeah. Let it down. I'm yeah, just being maybe. critical because it's a film I, I enjoy. Other than that, it's a very tight film and it's an enjoyable watch. See, I, I echo the, the same sentiment, really. It's it's a really solid film. It's about an hour and a half long. And as I said at the start, for me, there's no fat on this steak. You know, it is all meat. And as we said earlier, it does feel like a series of vignettes. There's no real plot. It's not like we're the roughest, toughest SASR recon team in the whole of the Delta. There's nothing like that. There's no, we hold the line and the, the MVA are just over the, the ridge and they're all kind of going to come and get us. There's nothing like that. I've written down, as I said at the start, it's men on a tour. You get them at, you get them at the start, they, they go, they have, some, they have some patrols, they have a bit of R&R, they have that spider fight in the middle because they're just blowing off steam. And then at the end, it's, um, it's Harry and Bill having a beer. And I really enjoy that. It's, it goes full circle. As, I, as opposed to you, I don't think anything falls fat for me, really. And you can enjoy a beer with it because it's funny, um, which I wasn't expecting it to be this as funny as I found it when I was younger. I think I last watched this in like 2012, or perhaps it's a while ago. Um, definitely before the um, the nice new crisper version. I mean, I had a really dodgy VHS of it, I think. But it's a solid film. If you haven't seen it, it's a great way to ease yourself into Australian war films because it's one of the better ones, I think. I would agree. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's an important film within the Australian war film genre. And I think yeah. it's an important Vietnam war movie as well. It's Aussies being Aussies in the odd angry shot, as the trailer said. So that was the first movie of Anzac month. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't seen the odd angry shot, um, I think we've, we've more than given you enough uh, reason to go and see it. It's, it's easily findable out there. Um, and the DVDs are quite cheap in it as well. And next week, there'll be another Australian film uh, for your delectation. Who knows? Will it be like Horseman? Will it be Gallipoli? Will it be Attack Force said? You'll have to come back next week and find out. So follow us in all the usual places, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and you can even catch the episodes on our YouTube channels because we upload them quite regularly. If you like to uh, have them on in the background when you're doing other things, let us know what you thought of your angry shot on our Twitter and our Facebook. And we'll catch you next week, guys. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.